The website BuzzFeed announcing it's going to be laying off 15% of its workforce. HuffPost announced it would cut 7% of its workforce. But it's really Google and Facebook that are just sucking up all the oxygen in the digital ad space. What does it say about internet news source? This may be one of the worst couple of weeks in the history of digital media. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. The digital publishing industry takes a big hit. The future just ain't what it used to be. Israel's prime minister moves into election mode, and it's clear that he plans to run against the Israeli media. Latin American literature meets journalism in the work and legacy of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And Karl Marx gets a Mandarin makeover. <laughs> Courtesy of propagandists in Beijing. It's been a tough couple of weeks for the digital news industry. More than a thousand workers, many of them reporters, have lost their jobs at companies like BuzzFeed, HuffPost, and Vice. Just five years ago, these digital news outlets were seen as the future of journalism. However, the layoffs suggest that the business model the companies all rely on, click based advertising revenue, just doesn't add up to a profitable bottom line. Then there's the problematic reliance on Facebook and Google to distribute digital news content. The two tech giants are eating up the bulk of digital ad revenues, leaving the buzz feeds of the world in roughly the same place as newspapers and other legacy news organizations before them, trying to find new models to make their businesses work. Sound familiar? That's because it is. Our starting point this week is BuzzFeed's headquarters in New York City. We're accustomed, I think, to traditional media companies losing people. We're accustomed to newspapers laying people off. But people expected that BuzzFeed and Vice and other digital companies were the future of digital media. There was an impression in some circles that these companies really figured out the future of digital news. One million subscribers on our Vice YouTube channel. We wanted to take you in, show you around on how we hit that million. This spate of layoffs have confronted us with the fact that while they are different from legacy publishers, they're perhaps not so different as we had imagined. On the second million, I'll do the whole tour naked. So now the question is, how do we find a way forward? The digital natives are growing restless. The BuzzFeed layoffs amount to more than 200 jobs. The company's revenue formula, using gossipy clickbait and lightweight listicles to drive traffic to the news side, was considered a model. Now its entire national security reporting team has been laid off, as well as parts of the national news desk. Another 250 jobs will disappear at Vice, a media company that traded on its understanding of the millennial market. It's now leaning away from news and focusing on its more lucrative divisions, such as film and television production. It's an industry-wide contraction that feels like a correction and amounts to an admission that for all their indie sass and swagger. In this episode, we go to Liberia and hang out with cannibal warlords. The buzz feeds and vices of the news world are as dependent on the tech giants as a child is on its parents. Hipster cred will only get you so far. They need Facebook and Google to survive. It's about the role that Google and Facebook have played in delivering audiences to publishers. Um, they both have algorithms that they are constantly changing without warning, and publishers will see their traffic tank overnight without any ability to respond to it. The problem is that when you rely on Facebook as your distribution mechanism, when Facebook changes, you really are at their mercy. The idea, and it seemed sound at the time, was let's maximize our strategies, our editorial strategies and advertising strategies to appeal to younger viewers slash readers and do it primarily on Facebook. But as Facebook decided to change how it operates, it has abandoned news in general. And it has hurt these companies that had built up their business practices to pander to Facebook. Even when news outlets clear the algorithmic hurdles and find you, there's the issue of how the tech giants cut up the cash, the ad revenues. Take Facebook. Before getting to a news article, you scroll through your news feed and the first wave of ads placed by Facebook. You'll eventually reach the article and the news outlets ad, but advertisers value that ad less than the ones Facebook has posted because Facebook ads are more effectively targeted. 
The platform knows more about you, your interests and buying habits, than the news outlet ever will. That's how more than 80% of news-related ad revenues end up in the pockets of the gatekeepers, Facebook and Google. There are billions of people out there. If you could get X number to click on something, you could get advertisers to pay X per click. Theoretically, if you accumulate enough volume, you can make money. And we know that that's possible because Google makes money and Facebook makes money. The problem is there is no way for a media company to achieve that kind of scale. Google and Facebook take up the vast majority of digital advertising. And so there's very little left for media companies and the amount of money that they're making from it is actually declining. So you have to chase, you have to run faster and faster just to stay in the same place. It's clear that the reliance on advertising alone is a, uh, is a problem for the industry. So it's a question of whether the publishing industry as a whole can find other sources of revenue to make up for some of the advertising that is flowing away from news and increasingly going to companies like Facebook and Google. The other revenue source that will likely dry up is from mainstream media organizations that have invested in their younger digital competitors. NBC Universal and Comcast have injected more than $400 million into BuzzFeed. Fox, Disney, and A&E Networks have pumped hundreds of millions into Vice. Verizon has long been vacuuming up media content providers such as Yahoo, AOL, and by extension HuffPost in multi-billion dollar deals. There may have once been a rationale for such investments, but those mainstream media companies are now counting their losses, in some cases writing them off, and looking to invest elsewhere. All those investments came from these big media companies who made most of their money in television, and pay television was just going off a cliff, being eaten by Netflix. They were seeing their most lucrative parts of their business declining, so they were desperate to reach these hard-to-reach young people in their 20s and early 30s. And Vice and BuzzFeed, they offered a way to reach these young audiences. And now it's unlikely that they're going to continue that investment just because of the difficulties in the online advertising market. Who exactly is going to be provide the funding for these companies as they go forward. Venture capital investors don't just give you hundreds of millions of dollars for nothing. They're going to expect that money back. It's going to have to come from somewhere because the revenue model is now in question. Not only are we questioning the growth rates of these companies, we're questioning sort of whether they can even continue to be the same size. So now you've got something that's not even growing. It's probably shrinking. That's not a business model that anybody is going to be interested in investing in. One model that is working in a limited way is the old-fashioned subscription model that so many news organizations have abandoned. The same week that BuzzFeed, Vice and HuffPost were shedding staff, the New York Times announced it now employs 1,600 journalists, the most in its history, and that it ended 2018 with a record 3.3 million digital subscribers, a 27% increase over the previous year. Having convinced many Americans that their journalism is worth supporting, papers like The Times and The Washington Post are thriving, the indirect beneficiaries of President Trump's attacks on the U.S. news media. However, very few news outlets have the name recognition, the prestige of The Times or The Post, and the digital newbies have gone all in on the digital advertising model for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. You see from the amazing performance of the New York Times Company, they've been able to create a good digital subscription model that is funding their newsroom. So there is hope if you're a big brand and you can get people to pay subscriptions, but if you're relying on advertising only, I think there's very, very little evidence it can work. I don't think all hope is lost, but it does mean that we must confront the two dragons. Facebook and Google. If we fail to confront Facebook and Google and their terrifying ability to distort journalism, to corrupt journalism, and to crush journalism, then we are in trouble. We have to break up those large companies to make sure that they are not so powerful, not so dominant. Those are fairly big tasks, but they're not impossible.
We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Marcella Pizarro. Marcella, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing an election in April. What's the latest on the media side of this story? Well, a few weeks ago, there were those billboards paid for by Netanyahu's Likud party featuring four Israeli journalists telling voters, quote, they will not decide, you decide. It looks like he's taking a page out of Donald Trump's media manual. Last Sunday, Netanyahu launched a weekly webcast on social media that pledges to, quote, get rid of the fake from the news. Netanyahu used the first show to celebrate his triumphs and to lambast the media. <laughs> He accuses them of teaming up with the police and the judiciary in three corruption cases. He calls it a witch hunt designed to force him out of office. Trump's got a similar show. It's called Real News Update. That one's hosted by Trump's daughter-in-law. The Israeli one is hosted by Eliraz Sadeh. He's famous not so much for his journalism, but for having appeared on a reality TV show. Which one? Irony alert, Big Brother. You really could not make it up. You've also been working on this week's feature story, the second in a series that you've done, about giants from the world of literature who often saw themselves as journalists, not just authors. Yes, the first story went out last year. It was about American writer Tom Wolfe. For the second instalment, I've been looking at Gabriel Garcia Marquez. He wrote books like A Hundred Years of Solitude, Love in the Time of Cholera, Chronicle of a Death Foretold. We think of him as a fiction writer. We think of magical realism. But he saw himself first and foremost as a journalist. One of the first things that jumped out at me on this was Garcia Marquez was the son of a telegraph operator. So he was born with Colombian news and information in his blood. Clearly. And he set up his first newspaper when he was just 12 years old. He called it El Comprimido, which is the Colombian word for what students call a cheat sheet. The paper lasted less than a week, but he stayed with journalism as a reporter, cinema critic, foreign correspondence starting out in the 1950s. Which is a key period in Latin American history. We're talking about the Cold War, we're talking about political upheaval across the continent and a rash of US-backed military coups. Which is why it's important to understand that political context, the time of extreme repression. In fact, Garcia Marquez was thrown out of Colombia for his outspokenness because ultimately, his form of journalism was unapologetically political. What today we call advocacy journalism. And what comes across when I spoke to the journalists in this piece, who studied under him or worked with him, is this constant tug of war between the literary and the journalistic, that wavering between fact and fiction. But does that not make his journalism fundamentally problematic? Perhaps, but the point is that people like Garcia Marquez make us think about journalism beyond debates on empiricism, objectivity, accuracy, and how the literary can get us nearer to truth of experience, Throughout this piece, we've used excerpts of Garcia Marquez's work to take viewers through the story, starting with something he said in periodismo. Fue jefe y fue el reportero abajo, fue comentarista, fue crítico de cine, fue enviado especial. Estuvo en la calle y estuvo en la redacción. La abuela de una amiga mía cartagenera. Es que conocía a García Márquez como socialmente, siempre decía, no, es que yo no entiendo por qué a Gavito pues, le dan tantos premios y él no se inventó nada. Todo eso que le ha contado, todo eso pasó. <risa> Thank you. 
A Gao le piden el favor de que vaya y haga un reportaje en Chocó. Porque hay una información según la cual hay una protesta pública de gente en las calles porque no hay suministros de agua ni servicios públicos y la gente está enfurecida. Y Gabo se va allá y llega al Chocó y empieza a ver. Llega a Quibdó, pasan los días, el editor no sabe nada de Gabo, empieza a buscarlo y empieza a buscarlo y le dice, Gabo, finalmente lo encuentra y le dice, ¿qué pasó? Entonces Gabo le dice, mira, la verdad es que yo llegué aquí ¿sí? y no hay protesta, no hay ninguna protesta. Ahora, la situación sí está muy grave. ¿sí? Y entonces, ¿qué hace Gabo? Hace la crónica y la manera como hace la crónica ¿sí? produce la protesta. ¿sí? La hermosa y triste canción compuesta por el maestro de escuela de una remota aldea chocuana. Yo tuve la fortuna de estar en un taller de, de periodismo organizado por la Fundación Nuevo Periodismo en México con eh, Rizar Kapuczynski y García Márquez, que fue algo así pues como que totalmente soñado. Entramos a discutir esto de que había como unos datos que ellos habían puesto en sus historias que realmente pues, no se ajustaban a la realidad. Y para algunos de los periodistas que estábamos en ese taller y pues que está, teníamos 25 años o 24 años, eh, nos parecía un poquito escandaloso que, que ellos hubieran inventado cosas. Pero García Márquez tuvo esta frase que a mí nunca se me olvida diciendo como, bueno, si uno para contar la verdad tiene que poner una lagrimita de más, pues, ¿qué más da? El mono Salgar le dijo un día, oye, Gao, mira a ver esta cosa, esta noticia que pasó aquí, un señor que duró no sé cuántos días, porque fue unos días, cantidad de días impresionante en el mar, un, un naufragio, murió no sé qué, sobrevivió él. La noticia había salido por todas partes, porque era una noticia insólita. ¿sí? Gabo la leyó, trabajó el tema y volvió a donde su editor y le dijo, ¿sabes qué? Yo quiero hacer una crónica de este náufrago. Le dijo el editor, pero ya ha salido en todas partes, ya no es la hora. Y yo, a todo yo te dije, era el momento, pero ya han pasado como un mes o mes. ¿Para qué? No, no, es que la historia real no la han contado. Gabo se fue, se sentó con este náufrago horas y horas y horas, que decidió cuando llegó otra vez a la redacción del espectador y le dijo al, al editor, a, al mono Segar, le dijo, ¿sabe qué? Terminé esta cosa, pero la quiero hacer en series, una por una, una serie, dos series, tres series, cuatro series, como las series de Netflix. ¿sí? Es verde y era como la corteza de un árbol. Y que empezó a generar una audiencia impresionante. La gente esperaba cada semana el nuevo capítulo de este náufrago. Series como la del náufrago eran realmente unas crónicas eh, periodísticas, casi que literarias, diría yo. Es hermana prima del reportaje, digámoslo así. Pero la crónica tiene color, tiene vida, tiene minuciosas... Eh, descripciones. Tuve la sensación de que tenía un sabor fresco y un poco amargo. Nosotros los latinoamericanos no somos como los anglosajones, que tenemos unas definiciones muy precisas sobre lo que es realmente. Es una historia contada con todos esos aderezos, ¿sí? y Gabo la sabía contar. La crónica literaria, periodística, eh, ha sido, yo creo que el formato privilegiado por los periodistas latinoamericanos. Pensaba que ese era un género que en Latinoamérica se estaba olvidando, que él llamaba los cronistas de Indias. Los cronistas eh, de Indias o las crónicas de las Indias eh, se conoce a ese género con el que nació, yo creo que mucho del periodismo como, como se le conoce ahora. Las primeras historias que hubo sobre América eh, fue después de, de la conquista, entonces García Márquez, a través de la Fundación Nuevo Periodismo, quería como revivir esta cosa de que los latinoamericanos narráramos nuestro continente.
García Márquez alguna vez dijo en una entrevista, con una terquedad enfermiza toda mi vida he soñado con tener un periódico. Fue eh, miembro del grupo eh, de la revista Alternativa y de hecho de su propio dinero financió en gran medida ese proyecto periodístico, pero a partir de los 80 en, quiere tener un medio propio. Entra, sin embargo, a el noticiero QAP con un grupo de amigos, un noticiero de televisión, y luego en los años 90 eh, decide establecer una revista y termina comprando la revista Cambio y crea la fundación, el García Márquez, de esta segunda etapa de periodismo, en que ya es un periodista independiente, es un García Márquez que no quiere que se invente nada. Enormes barrios marginales en las ciudades mayores de Chile. Hay toda una generación también de cronistas, es decir, de narradores periodísticos. Y creo que la Fundación ha tenido la capacidad de adaptarse a los cambios del periodismo, de reconocer que el periodismo contemporáneo adquiere muchas formas. A mí lo que más me alegra es pensar que Gabriel García Márquez sigue inspirando más allá de que esté vivo o no. Yo siento que él se volvió un poco como el verdadero biógrafo de Colombia, eh, mucho más que los historiadores, ¿no? A pesar de que él se estaba inventando como un mundo mágico, él logró explicar como el sustrato y como el imaginario colectivo, ¿no? Entonces siento que en esta época tan confusa, tener a alguien que pudiera narrar a ese nivel y le ayudar a uno a entender más allá de la razón qué es lo que sucede, eh, pues creo que sería muy útil, ¿no? Pero no, no me imagino él cómo, cómo, cómo lo haría, pero seguro sería increíble. And finally, Karl Marx is getting a makeover more than a century after his death, courtesy of Beijing. The propaganda department of the Communist Youth League has a job to do to make communism more appealing to the younger generation. So it's produced an anime series celebrating the life of the author of the Communist Manifesto. Now, you might not recognize this version of Marx. Gone is the thick beard, the gray hair, the German accent, all replaced by a dashing, tall, blue-eyed, love-struck philosopher who's fluent in Mandarin. It's a seven-part series called The Leader. It's been released on China's biggest video streaming site, Billy Billy. There's a joke in there somewhere about the memes of production, but we can't come up with it, so we'll just leave you now with the trailer, and we'll see you next time, here at The Listening Post.